I feel it's my calling. I believe that I can be an advocate for the common man. So that is why I request that you give me that little newspaper you own, the San Francisco Examiner. The newspaper has redefined the way America tells its stories. But its rise to prominence was fueled by a bitter rivalry between Joseph Pulitzer. We'll dedicate ourselves to the cause of the people. A man who built himself up from nothing. And William Randolph Hearst. Excuse me. You're fine. The wealthy son of a business tycoon. Two media titans battle for the loudest, most trusted voice in journalism. You don't care that he's printing lies? Blurring the lines between fact and fiction. You ready to start a war? Million readers are. As they lie, cheat, and steal their way to the top. To the New York Journal. Here's the New York Journal. An intense conflict that would define journalism as we know it today and change America forever. Did you hear that the governor is going to Jefferson next week? The governor is getting popular. Mr. Augustine, would you mind telling me about the new mental hospital? And how much is your construction firm charging the city for it? Mr. Augustine, Mr. Augustine. From his earliest days as a reporter, Joseph Pulitzer has aspired to be the voice of the people. It's a dream born of his humble beginnings as a young immigrant from Hungary. He came here struggling. He had really had a fight to survive in this new country. I mean, his immigrant experience was a pretty harsh one. Pulitzer's life as an immigrant gives him a first-hand view of the divide between the rich and the poor. So when he's offered a job at a St. Louis newspaper, he jumps at the opportunity. Journalism gives Pulitzer a platform for his unique voice, one he can use to protect people just like him from being exploited by the rich and powerful. A newspaper in, in a town like St. Louis was geared towards men of a certain class. But for Pulitzer, the newspaper fit his sense of social responsibility, his sense that the poor people needed a defender. And he very much saw himself as that, that type of person. Pulitzer is on a mission to find corruption and use his writing to expose it head on, all the while maintaining a high standard for accuracy and his fearless brand of journalism quickly catches on. For the next 10 years, Pulitzer's tactics help him climb the ranks in journalism and rise above his once impoverished lifestyle. With the money he's earned, he acquires two failing newspapers and merges them into the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, a venerable newspaper that's still around today. With Pulitzer at the helm, it quickly becomes the city's top newspaper. But soon enough, he outgrows St. Louis and decides to take his brand of journalism to the greatest newspaper town in America. Pulitzer moves to New York because that was the center of journalism. The newspapers there had the biggest circulation. They had the biggest impact. The best newspapers in American history were newspapers that operated out of New York City.
Pulitzer purchases a declining newspaper called the New York World and begins to put his unique stamp on it. Our rock of faith will be accuracy. We'll expose all fraud and sham. Fight all public evil. We'll dedicate ourselves to the cause of the people. But to make it in New York City, Pulitzer needs a newspaper that stands out. Pulitzer saw in New York City a place where millions of immigrants were coming with no jobs in many cases, with no idea of what to expect or how to navigate the United States. Pulitzer's mission, create a newspaper for New York's immigrants and working class. But in order to attract these new readers, he's going to need to revolutionize the newspaper. Newspapers back then were really a boring, drab affair written primarily for the upper class. They were very gray. The typography was the same across the whole page. No such thing as a big headline. And they were little more than propaganda sheets and often supported by the political parties. Pulitzer envisions a paper that uses bold headlines to draw attention to his stories of the everyday struggles and successes of the immigrant population. He wanted to tap into this market with a whole new style of news that was meant to entertain people, to get them turned on to this idea of the American experience, what it meant to be an American. And he knew from his own first-hand experience what that was like. Within six months, the New York world circulation triples to 45,000. And within a year and a half, Pulitzer is selling 100,000 newspapers. And it's all because of his bold approach. There's the expression, think out of the box. And when it comes to genius, that's exactly what you have to do. You have to look way outside the box in order to find that glimmer of inspiration which will propel you into the future. Joseph Pulitzer is on his way to owning the largest newspaper in the country. And the power and influence he wields doesn't go unnoticed. miles away. You are absolutely adorable. Do you know that? Thank you. William Randolph Hearst has been following Pulitzer's rise with a keen interest. William Randolph Hearst was a child of privilege. His father made a fortune in mining. So young Will went to good schools. He went to expensive schools. He was indulged. You could say he was quite spoiled. But for Hearst, getting out from his father's shadow and making a name for himself is the first priority. Careful. I haven't read this one yet. The newspaper industry may just be the path he needs. Hearst is specifically inspired by Pulitzer. He's been reading Pulitzer's world. He sees the excitement that this paper generates. He sees the enormous circulation that Pulitzer has racked up. He thinks he'd like to do something like that. Hearst sees the newspaper as a source of influence, and he wants to bring Pulitzer's brand of journalism to the West Coast. I feel it's my calling. I believe that I can be an advocate for the common man. So that is why I request that you give me that little newspaper you own, the San Francisco Examiner. 
I think the fundamental difference between William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer. Pulitzer is interested in power in order to achieve a particular set of reforms. William Randolph Hearst is interested in power to advance himself. He had an unlimited supply of money that he could use to fulfill whatever ambition he wanted. Hearst is handed ownership of the San Francisco Examiner, a failing newspaper with subpar reporting and lackluster circulation numbers. Excuse me, can you tell me where I can find the, the editor-in-chief, please? Thank you. I'm William Hurst. George's boy. Didn't he tell you I was coming in today? No. No. Excuse me. You fired. Both to go down to City Hall, speak to someone down there. I've heard Hearst that rebuilds the San Francisco Examiner from scratch, fashioning his paper to the style that has brought Pulitzer so much success in New York. Hearst makes the Examiner into what we now call a yellow paper. Since San Francisco was already kind of a feisty town, it was hard to shock people, but he was making the paper visually more entertaining something you'd want to pick up and be attracted by the headlines. Hearst's plan pays off, and it isn't long before he's gained a massive following. We are number one! Yeah! In its first year under Hearst, the Examiner doubles in circulation. And soon, the paper that once couldn't turn a profit is an undeniable success. Don't be asking for that much more money here. One more. But Hearst wants to expand his empire even further. And following in the footsteps of his idol, Joseph Pulitzer, he sets his eye on a New York City paper of his own. Hearst's success is based on a checkbook. He has unlimited resources to bring to war in New York, and now he's ready to come and compete with the master himself. He's coming to duel with Pulitzer. It's like two Western gunslingers. Instead of OK Corral, it's going to be Fifth Avenue, New York. Joseph Pulitzer has established himself as a newspaper giant. His New York world has become the largest newspaper in the country. And he's turned an elite industry into a medium for the masses. But his reign is about to be challenged by one man. William Randolph Hearst. Fresh off the success of his West Coast newspaper, Hearst arrives in New York City. New York at this time is a massive and rapidly changing and fascinating and colorful and scary and volatile city. Hearst dives in and it's very clear that Hearst is going to spend whatever money it takes. After purchasing a penny paper called the New York Morning Journal, Hearst moves quickly to build his empire. Over here is the editor-in-chief, so I can keep an eye on him. This 
is City Bureau. Over here will be sports. And where you're sitting, international. Journalists were part of the brand. They were part of what you were selling. They were star journalists. They were big names and who were writing for newspapers in those days. So people would buy a newspaper in part to see what these stars had written. With Pulitzer away on vacation, That should last you the rest of the year. Hearst moves to phase one. Steal his staff. One by one, Hearst picks off the cash cows from Pulitzer's pocket. His city editor. His business manager. His best artist. And even his Sunday editor. To the New York Journal. Here, here. Hearst was ruthless. He had more money than God, and he knew it. The fact that he would go to the world's employees with a stack full of cash and say, you're working for me now. He really was hell-bent on taking over the newspaper industry. Only months after arriving in New York, Hearst has acquired the greatest newspaper staff that money can buy. And it's not the only move he's made to try and take down his biggest competition. Phase two of his plan, match Pulitzer's page count. Hearst uses Pulitzer's own tactics, but he pushes it up two or three notches past whatever Pulitzer would do, had done, was capable of doing. Hearst wants to knock the legs out under Pulitzer and take over Pulitzer's terrain with the same kind of readership. Hearst packs the front page of his paper with sensational headlines about scandals and crime. And he does it all for one penny, half the price of the New York world. To stand at a competition, you can't stand still throwing yourself all the way deep into the battle. That's what playing to win's all about. In just three months, Hearst has doubled his circulation. Got him, bitch. King of New York journalism is in danger of being dethroned. Both of these men were alpha males. Both of them were used to walking into a situation and triumphing. had come in and invented a new kind of journalism and basically wiped the floor with the Herald and the Tribune. And now somebody was going to do that to him. His pride was involved. His pride was going to be hurt. That should last you the rest of the year. William Randolph Hearst's mission was simple. Crush Joseph Pulitzer's newspaper at whatever the cost. Poaching his staff is only the beginning. We sell 16 pages for a cent. We sell eight pages for two cents. We'll drop the price. If Hurst can afford it, we can.
Pulitzer viewed Hearst's attack deeply personally. Pulitzer found himself in mortal combat with a man whose basic weapon was an unlimited amount of money that he had not earned. This is contrary to everything that Pulitzer's own experience had had in life and everything that Pulitzer believed in. Your lead needs to be five words shorter. Those five words are the difference between a good article and a bad article. This is gonna kill us. No, it won't. This is exactly what we wanted. Now we just have to stay on the offensive. When you think about rivalries, people always have to think about what gets the competitive juices going. I woke up every morning wanting to knock Siemens off or knock Mitsubishi off. That's part of the juices that flow in a competitive environment. And I know right where to hit him. You say we uh, spread our wings a little, huh? Hearst seizes the opportunity when he discovers Evangelina Cisneros, an 18-year-old girl caught in the crosshairs of the Cuban Revolution. The young Cuban rebel has been imprisoned by the Spanish. And for Hearst, it's just the story he needs to boost his readership. The story of Cuba and the oppression and what Spain is doing is going to serve Hearst in his fight against Pulitzer and his fight for circulation. Hearst decides to champion the struggle of a virtuous girl held against her will as a way to get his readers interested in the rebels' cause against Spain. We gotta give him the story of a century, complete with a hero and a damsel in distress. A fearless reporter and a Cuban rebel. She's locked up, but he's got a plan. And not a moment passes without the fear of sudden death. Hearst publishes a theatric account of Evangelina's escape fashioning his story with the dramatics of a play and keeping his readers wanting more. The way the Hearst newspapers reported it was like a soap opera unfolding in front of their eyes. The story's a hit. Readers are enthralled by Hearst's take on Evangelina's daring escape. I can't express the horrors and fear I faced when I was in prison. But now I'm free. Hearst transforms his heroine into a celebrity. Thanks to my brave friend at the New York Journal. What he's really a genius at doing was bursting out of the columns of the newspaper and making the story into an event by getting people involved in participating in the story. Americans begin to rally around Cuba's struggle against Spain just as he planned. How do we compete with this? Joseph Pulitzer can only watch as Hearst basks in the spotlight, but he refuses to sink down to the level of his bitter rival. Pulitzer had signs in his newsroom all over the walls. Accuracy, accuracy, accuracy. He believed that reporting ought to be accurate. This is hard. Hard. He offered me my own column. He never offered me that. I see. And you don't care that he's printing lies unsubstantiated claims. Either something is true or it's not.
Pulitzer's top editor, Arthur Brisbane, defects to the journal. Brisbane's switch to the journal represents an achievement for Hearst in that he's made it clear the journal's going to be around. But it's a betrayal of Pulitzer. I mean, Pulitzer felt betrayed by Brisbane and anybody else who left his paper to go and work for, of all people, Hearst. Joseph Pulitzer is standing firm on principle. But those same beliefs could cost him his empire. heels of publishing the Evangelina Cisneros story. He offered me my own column. And now equipped with his rival's top editor. William Randolph Hearst Journal has become one of the most popular newspapers in the country, creating stiff competition for Joseph Pulitzer's New York world. But Hearst isn't stopping there. And soon, a tragic event provides him his next big opportunity. On February 15th, 1898, the USS Maine is docked in Havana, Cuba. When a sudden explosion rips apart the ship, 266 American sailors lose their lives. Here's your headline. The work of an enemy. And I want an extradition on the streets within an hour. You ready to start a war? A million readers are. Hearst jumps to the conclusion that this was the work of Spanish treachery, is the word that he put in headlines. And there was no evidence of that. But for Hearst, it quickly became a reason for the United States to go to war with Spain over Cuba. When Hearst's paper begins printing headlines holding Spain responsible for the tragedy, Pulitzer has no choice but to respond. Joseph Pulitzer saw that if they didn't join in this war cry, they would fall behind in their sales and lose a lot of readers, and everybody would go to Hearst. Joseph Pulitzer faces a crisis of conscience. Either hold on to his journalistic integrity or compete on Hearst's level. Hearst made Cuba into a story. I don't think the nation would have paid as much attention to it had it not been for the journal constantly reporting what was going on. But by doing so, bullets had to respond. For Pulitzer, there's no other choice. Without any hard evidence, his newspaper also begins to speculate about what happened to the Maine. With Hearst coming up more and more every day with weirder and weirder stories, it seemed impossible for Pulitzer's world to stop and step back for a minute and say, this isn't where we want to go. He was so involved in the competition with Hearst that he lost his bearings. Day after day, the two titans are locked in battle as the world and the journal try to one-up each other's reporting on the main. It's a misnomer to say that what these two newspapers were doing in New York triggered the United States entry into the war. But what they did do is they were like the bellows on a flame. They both helped stoke a nation that was eager for war. On April 25th, 1898, after two months of sensational headlines, Congress declares war against Spain. 
the war becomes a golden opportunity for both Pulitzer and Hearst to sell more papers. And between them, no expense is spared. It's very clear that Pulitzer's paper is trying very hard to be just as grabby, just as entertaining, just as sensational. In the spiraling competition, Hearst was pouring so much money into this, and the world felt we need to put that much money in too. We can't fall behind. They're both spending enormous amounts of money. Gentlemen, do we have 300,000 readers? No! Do we have 600,000 readers? No! Do we have 900,000 readers? No! How many readers do we have? One million! Yeah. By August 1898, after only four months, the conflict in Cuba is over. Hearst gets exactly what he wanted, a circulation of the morning and evening editions of his journal it's one million copies. His newspaper has become a dominant force in modern journalism. But Pulitzer's struggle has only just begun. Joseph, what are these numbers? Last month's losses. The month before that. And the month before that. I will not raise prices. I will not lose readers. When the war is over, circulation drops, and they've got to cut somewhere. Where to cut? He can't cut salaries of their staff because their staff might defect to the other guy. He can't raise the prices. What is he gonna do? How many readers do we have? One million! The Spanish-American War has come to an end. Both Joseph Pulitzer and William Hurst have spent a fortune covering the event, and now the bills must be paid. But unlike Hearst, Pulitzer doesn't have a family fortune to keep his paper afloat. Pulitzer must make a sacrifice so he looks to the one group of people that don't have the power to defend themselves. The newsboys. How many you want? 50. How many you want? The newsies, as they're called, were these deeply impoverished children, many of whom were homeless and lived under bridges. <laughs> they would get a bundle of papers for which they would pay for it at a very discounted rate, and then they'd go out and sell it, and that's how they earned their keep. Pulitzer and Hearst depended on these kids because a newspaper could print hundreds of thousands of papers and sell them on the street within an hour. The newsboys' only means of survival are the pennies they earn shouting out headlines on the street. During the Spanish-American War, Hearst and Pulitzer raised the prices they charged the newsboys because of the enormous expense of covering the war. Rather than selling them 100 copies for 50 cents, they sold them 100 copies for 60 cents. And if they didn't sell all their newspapers, they didn't get any refund. Now that the war is over, the newsboys assume that Pulitzer will return the bulk price to 50 cents. But in an effort to repay his debts, Pulitzer refuses to give up a single penny. At the journal, 
William Hurst has a choice to make. He knows if he wants to keep his newspaper in the top spot, he'll have to stay on par with his rival. When Pulitzer and Hearst face these disenfranchised street kids who are just needing a little more money, it's understandable that Hearst, the rich kid from San Francisco, was unsympathetic. The fact that Pulitzer was unsympathetic to these kids is contrary to everything that Pulitzer believed in. The Newsies represent the world that Pulitzer had left, and he now becomes the protector of wealth as opposed to the one who attacked it in 1883. In July 1899, with the city's top paper shutting them out, the Newsies go on strike. The boys protest. Shocking everybody, the boys protest. There are lots of them. They get together. They insist they're going to stay together. Their leaders emerge. It's covered wildly in the other newspapers who love seeing this kind of tilting of the lances at the great Hearst and Pulitzer empires. The Times, the Tribune, they're all giving it massive coverage. They make them seem like, you know, little heroes going up against the big corporate monsters. More than 5,000 newsboys shut down New York City. To gain attention for their cause, they clogged the Brooklyn Bridge, halting city traffic for hours. With the Newsies in protest, distribution of the world and journal grinds to a halt. Over the course of two weeks, circulation of the New York world drops over 50%. Pulitzer at this point has forgotten his roots. He has forgotten in a sense that he was once a Newsie. He is fighting these street kids. And at some point, sanity had to prevail. Now the newsboy's protest is not only costing him his business, but also his reputation. The careers of two newspaper giants are now in jeopardy, thanks to their own ruthless tactics. strike has brought the world and the journal to their knees. In a matter of days, circulation of both Pulitzer and Hearst's newspapers plummet. It's just not right. I know you think that, but... They're just children and they're holding us hostage. If Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst are going to save their businesses, the two newspaper giants have no choice but to put aside their rivalry and agree to make a deal with the newsboys. The strike did show them that they needed to cooperate just a little bit. It was reluctant, but there was an understanding that ruthless breakneck competition was not gonna serve either of their interests. They won't lower the bulk price but they agree to refund the newsboys for any papers they don't sell. The newsies accept the proposal.
and on August 2nd, 1899, the strike ends. The victory of the Newsies is a dramatic moment in American labor history when the most disenfranchised, most powerless group of kids come together and fight these two giants. It's David and Goliath on a huge scale. William Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer are the reigning kings of New York City journalism. But it's clear they're no longer just the voice of the people. They also represent the interests of an industry. In some ways, Pulitzer and Hearst were Coke and Pepsi. They were Ford and Chevy. They went at each other. They improved each other. In some ways, they made each other a little worse, a little more craven in their search for audiences. The newspaper giants may have won, but Joseph Pulitzer fears that his competition with Hearst has tarnished his legacy. It's a little disturbing to think that, a, that Pulitzer, the champion of the people, went after a bunch of little boys. But a lot of the decisions he made were made in fear of letting Hearst win. I think Pulitzer felt an extreme need to atone. Pulitzer donates $2 million to Columbia University which helps to develop one of the country's first journalism schools in hopes of restoring his own name. One of Pulitzer's legacies was creating what is now regarded as the premier training spot for journalists. But the second legacy, and the one that was most important to him, was the prize that would bear his name, the Pulitzer Prize, because it really reflected his notion of journalism. And that prize has become the biggest and most important prize you can get in journalism. William Hearst uses his journalism empire as a stepping stone to a career in politics, and eventually, Hollywood. William Randolph Hearst's reputation has survived in large part because one of the great movies of all time, Citizen Kane by Orson Welles, was based on his life. I think otherwise he would be less well-known today than he is. A bitter rivalry between two publishing giants revolutionized journalism and propelled mainstream media as we know it today. Hearst and Pulitzer together made the newspaper essential for daily life. So much of today's newspapers, more than 100 years later, still reflects many of the innovations and changes that Hearst and Pulitzer made. They were responsible for a large part of the way newspapers work today. The modern mass media that we turn to every day comes from the achievement of these two men. The very notion of consuming news as a form of entertainment, that you want to read about what's happening in your city, you want to read about famous people, all come from the way they changed culture and the way they changed media. The achievement of these two men was, on a historic scale, enormous.